Hello dear YouTube friends. Today is Monday, so I'm wishing you a very good Monday and over here right now it's afternoon, late in the afternoon. Um, I've already got some a part of my food that's on the fire right now. Can you say that on the fire? It's boiling. I'm cooking beets, red beets. Um, and I'm also in the act of um, painting um, um, a piece of a trunk of a tree that's in our front garden. And um, it's, it's a monk's job. It's um, the detailing of... Um, the reason why I picked this particular tree is because it's a very old tree but it's an uh, it's a tree that was how shall we say this it's not a naturally formed or grown tree it's a there is a falcon right <laughs> sorry my eyes fell on a falcon that was right behind the camera uh, it, it's no use showing it to you today is storm very stormy outside um i just read in the news that um big trucks have been blown over on the highways and did you hear the rattling? That's my fish. That's my sparkling gourami you can hear. If you hear it, it, it sounds like um, a magpie, but then it's quieter, but maybe you can notice. Uh, but anyway, it's very stormy. So now when I see a bird, there is no sense in me. And now... Sorry about that. I okay. This is going nowhere. <laughs> I'll try and pick up the. I'll try and pick up the thread. Um, the thing is that I've been trying to record videos a lot lately, but um, my husband works from home now. Sometimes two days a week. Sometimes uh, a part of the day. Um, once or twice sometimes three three times a week my daughter's um school hours are also a bit um unpredictable and um very often she has shorter days than we'd anticipated so um let me just say that my videos have been cut short a lot by um people who came home unexpectedly and I don't know if you've ever made a video filming yourself and how you feel about that, but it is a thing, a big thing, um, because watching yourself is always weird and you feel hyper-conscious about yourself. And even though I do film on the fly, I do feel hyper-conscious. So the moment somebody walks into um, the living room, the kitchen, and then there is this outside space of the kitchen, I feel a little bit vulnerable. Hold on a second. So I'm tapping my face because I'm hoping it's um, you're focusing on my face rather than on the background. Um, but so, and I always feel quite disturbed by that, you know, um, it, I, I lose my mojo every time it happens. So inside I felt like, oh God, no, not again. But anyway, so I'm painting this tree and the reason I chose this tree is because of the interesting texture in the bark. Um, it's an old tree. It's a tree that didn't grow its natural shape, you know, from seed and seed, seedling, a little, you know, stem and then a trunk and everything. This tree, I don't know what it's called in English. I don't think it's called ent Ented, I think. Um, but what happens is that what you can you can make a tree grow faster if you um, pick the stem of one tree cut it off and then you know you sort of um, yeah how can we say this when you don't know the terminology it's quite difficult you can put a piece of new tree in there and then it will grow from there don't know what the name is but anyway that's what that tree is so it's very often um, applied for trees that are meant to stay small 
for in gardens um, because um, if you would plant the natural shape you would be having a tree that needs a park sized garden. We don't have a park sized garden. We have um, a good sized garden in the front and in the back but very um, regular for you know normally family homes so um, yeah it's a small tree but it's got it's old it's very old in fact we are um, its brother or sister already died um, we live on the edge of town and when there is a west wind southwest wind we are actually the first house in town that the wind will hit so there are lots and lots of plants and trees that we can't plant because um, for instance camellias or peonies you know the wind is going to smash them to pieces and even um, shrubs and little trees that grow in this area naturally on the dikes um, you know where they catch a lot of wind we now know that they grow very slowly and the reason why they grow so slowly you know if we plant them in the backyard where we have fences around there and hedge um, and the house so there is a lot less wind in the backyard if we were to plant the same shrub or tree in the backyard they would grow really quickly so right let's go back to um, to this tree it's we call it I call it a monk's job monk's work because this is incredible detailing and it's not finished by far although the trick for me the hard thing for me is always to stop in time so what I need to do is you know the most important thing of all is we need to know that this is a hollow area and that this piece lies much more on top as well as this and then to also you know this has to be the edge of the tree so this is the the side of the tree and what I also want to bring across is um, I am definitely not going to paint all the details of the bark in this piece it's impossible so I have to simplify but I have to do that in a way that you can still see that this is that kind of tree or in the family of that tree it's close enough for me you know there is you could be doing this um, botanically but then I would have to choose a much smaller piece of bark and make a much bigger painting in order to do that and I didn't want to do it what I wanted to do was sort of like um, the way I take pictures um, I like to take pictures from up close and I like to just see textures and depth and um, you know the the spaces that withdraw in the tree and the spaces that you know pop out that go out into the world so that's what I wanted to uh, paint what I'm doing and it's not finished um, it's not very much more work though um, I think this is um, going to be a very typical example of me needing to stop in time because what I tend to do is I tend to overwork them and pardon me and move into the kind of paintings that I do um, you know with the incredibly detailed cork like bark um, you know the fantasy trees with all the creatures in there you know that's a lot of extra detail and um, I love doing that because it's very meditative but for this particular tree this is a real tree so I don't want to do it for this one so I need to you know um, I need to stop myself in time and not make that happen so that's what I'm doing now and you know in um, working on this um, I've been trying the museum the museum aquarelle by Karen Dash a little bit more but as you can see on the by the tips of the of the pencils you know the only one I've um, sharpened a lot already is the natural umber color number 548 and the other one I've used is um, Castle Earth um, 046 um, so the brown tones 
And the thing is, um, I already did a very, um, very quick um, review of my very first impressions right after making my little color chart. Um, you can watch that back, it's a very short video, um, especially, you know, um, for my doing. Um, and the thing is that they give off really great color. So in, if, if you if you want to use these pencils for, you know, like watercolor, um, you know, they work fine. But the thing is, um, I always use watercolor pencils in, as, um, in mixed media uh, projects. So I never work with watercolor pencils alone. So what I always do, if, when I use them, if I use them, I will lay down, um, you know, I will, sometimes I draw a sketch, sometimes I go on the fly with watercolor, but after a sketch, I color a base, you know, do base painting with um, watercolor. And then um, uh, there are some parts I will keep on working with watercolor or ink. Um, and, but there will also be parts that I will use watercolor pencils for. Um, and sometimes I use pastel pencils or um, uh, sometimes uh, acrylic inks can be really great with watercolor as well. Um, but what is important to me is sometimes you want to have something very transparent to go over your watercolors. And then I will nearly always use watercolor uh, paints and apply them very carefully, you know, in a glaze. But um, what I also sometimes really, really need is um, a much more covering color, much more opaque. Um, what works really, really great for that is pastel pencil, but pastel pencil has one very big downside for me. If you don't fixate the color, it's very, very um, tender and, and and fragile so um, then you need to apply fixative and what happens in my case when I apply fixative is where the hell did my pastel pencil go um, so then you need to apply another layer of pastel pencil more fixative another layer and blah blah blah, blah. so you keep going on and on so what I love using them is color pencil or watercolor pencil to apply a layer of color Sometimes you want to have a transparent layer and if you work with oil um, color pencils, they are more transparent than wax pencils, for instance. Um, and sometimes I use the watercolor pencils. Um, I have the full set of Elbert Dura by Faber-Castell, which I really love since they lay down more pigment, I think, than um, the, the Polychromos. Um, so I very often work with watercolor and the Elbrick Dura and sometimes um, uh, the pastel pencils. But this time um, I looked into the Museum Aquarelle by Karen Dash. Um, and I have to admit in this case, it was a little bit um, a matter of, you know, everybody says it's the Rolls Royce and the pencils, so I need to have that. Um, and I did check out quite a few reviews and one of the reviews said um, be careful because this pencil is not as transparent it's more opaque than other watercolor pencils which is what triggered me to buy them because I was looking for you know I I don't like using gouache over watercolor because I think gouache can be so overwhelming and overpowering and also when you have the the translucent brightness that you can have in watercolor where the paper shows through and you know makes your work vibrant then comes to gouache that really you know sort of immediately throws it back onto the floor it's like it's like a drop shot in tennis it's like it, it just captures all the light and it's matte and bam the the vibrancy can be completely gone so I don't like combining the two since I find them sometimes I do but I find that um, working in gouache only is for me then a better way because uh, that has a completely different char character than when you work with watercolor and you want the benefit of the translucence and everything. So I thought, you know what, if these pencils are slightly more opaque than, than the Albert Duras, they might just be it for me. And I was so tempted because there was a really, really good offer in one of the 
art supply stores for the entire set and I thought uh, I was considering getting them and then I thought you know what you've been preaching for so long in all your videos to never ever buy complete sets again but to just start out with the colors that you love so I did I actually really um, put together um, a set of colors that I use a lot so I checked all the pigments um, that are in here and um, with the aid of the pigment numbers I bought the colors I bought 20 of them and I'm sorry I did so I said it in the previous video and I'm not here to to bash Karen Dash because they've got really great products although I think they are let me say these and the luminance I find them crazy expensive and the neo colors and you know I I absolutely adore the Neo Color um, uh, pastels. Um, not the Neo Color Two, not the. I like the other ones, the oil pastels and the wax pastels. I think oil pastels. They are really, really amazing. Um, but the price is just well, anyway. But they are super good. I really like the luminance that I do have um, a, a good set of now. Um, but I don't like these watercolor pencils. Um, and I wanted to share that with you because I think I think what happens these days is that, you know, um, if you're doing reviews on YouTube, for many people, not for me, for many people, you have these um, affiliate links to places where you can buy them. And people will say, well, there are affiliate links, but I will give you my honest opinion. Well, the problem is that even though you feel you are honest when you're doing an affiliation um, even if it's not an affiliation with the brand but with an art supply store is that you have an ulterior motive as well maybe you do want to be honest about the um, about the product you're using at the same time you really want people to buy the product to try for themselves so you don't want to be too negative about them you want the people to like them and maybe because they can make a little money for you, you like them a little bit more than you would if you wouldn't be able to make money from it. So I've always stayed away from doing um, affiliations because I know, I know I respond differently when I've been, you know, if somebody's gifting me something or, you know, even if I, even if I still want to be honest and if I still want to be very direct about it, so, but online, I found nothing but really good reviews about these watercolor pencils. However, let me tell you, they are, like I said in the video, they are awesome when it comes down to colors. Um, you know, there are really great pigments in here, pigments I love using. And when you lay down the pencil on paper, you go over it with a brush. You know, it's a wonderful, beautiful, bright color that comes comes from that. The problem is, and that's something that I don't think I can use these a lot, or, well, um, they are very, very hard. So when you lay them down on watercolor pen, on watercolor paper, I find some of these colors don't give off their color very easily. So you have to press really hard, go over it again and again and again, and then you it will it will always remain visible in the texture of the paper. Um, some a, a few a good few of these pencils actually had scratchy little particles in them, and I don't you know I didn't um, sharpen um, all these pencils. You know they're so expensive. I'm expecting I don't have to. So I don't think it, it, it's a matter of, um, or maybe it's a matter of using these pencils for the first time, not having sharpened them. But um, some were really scratchy up to the point where you can see scratch marks in the paper, even when you wet them afterwards. So that renders them basically unusable to me since I always used watercolor pencils as a final layer on top of my painting and the last thing I want to do is run the risk that I end up scratching my painting when it's almost finished when it's already had about 60 70 layers the last thing I want is for these pencils to mess up the painting in that late stadium a stage 
So I am a little bit confused, I have to so, Somebody asked me, are these for real? Aren't these, you know, um, copies? No, they are real. I bought them at a reliable art store. These are real, the real thing. It's just that I don't know what paper these would work really well on. I tried them now on Canson Monval, which is a type of paper that I always use for color charts, um, for my um, my watercolor sketchbooks and for mixed media work. And But I've also now tried them on cotton paper. And I found that they were a little hard on the cotton paper as well. Um, so I will keep trying to find a purpose for them in my work, but I have a gut feeling that I won't be using these a lot. And I am actually sorry that I drove myself crazy. You know, and that's something I wanted to share with you that, um, it's one, you know, I've, if you've seen previous reviews of mine and, and videos then you've seen that sometimes I feel troubled a little bit by doing the reviews because when I tell you right now for instance this tree has been carried out in you know Museum Aquarella and Daniel Smith paint and Roman Schmal Aquarius um, when I show you this and I say these are the paints I use for that um, maybe you will start to feel you need to own these art supplies in order to make art and that's just not true and what's especially not true is that you need all of them but there is this culture online on youtube um there are so many people out there doing one review after another when you see their studios they look like art supply stores they have everything and um you know of course partly there is a sense of ooh excitement how wonderful that would be but on the other hand what 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 i think is not a really great thing is it makes people want stuff it makes people feel they are missing out if they don't have it I felt I was missing out on these. I felt I should have had them for a long time. I felt I should have done a review about these a long time ago. And um, why? So somebody said you've got to send them back to the store. But I use them all already for a color chart. So I don't think I can. So I'm keeping this for learning money. If you see me doing this all the time. It has been an incredibly stormy day here today. There were big trucks that were blown over on the highways. And um, all day long, um, I've had birds sheltering, seeking sheltering in the garden. And just now there were a couple of gulls playing in the wind. And there um, was, there were uh, two falcons that were chasing after the doves because the doves now are tired from holding on to the branches of the trees. So the falcons are trying to grab the chance and get a really nice duck for dinner tonight. So that's something I notice now. I, I don't know, you know, I really care about my, well, about the birds in our garden, which I sometimes call my birds. Um, at the same time, I also care about the falcons, but I always find it a little bit sad when it happens. and. In the past weeks, we've had a peregrine falcon visiting our garden. They are amazing, or 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 inspiring um, birds of prey. The way they hunt, it's just you can't but admire that. But you know, it's kind of sad too because um, I've been feeding the birds for so long that they know exactly how to get me to feed them. What they will do is they will do kamikaze attacks on my on my studio window. So I'm sitting. This is my desk, and you know, right behind the camera is the um, the window. Uh, can I turn this around while? I'm yes. Oh God. So this is one of the feeding places. That little house there on the on the on the shed. Um, and then in the back, I'm zooming into that, is a table and there is food there as well. And more to the right, there is food as well. Um, 
but the birds so this is the edge of the shed of the roof and um back to me now now that you've seen it so that's about three meters away from where i'm sitting what the doves will do is they will do kamikaze dives against my window so my window is always dirty there will always be uh, greasy streaks of um, the the wings and the and the chest of the birds, um, and very often you will literally see an impression like <laughs> because they they do it really hard. If I don't hurry up, you know they will start softly and then they will do it harder. And if in the summer um, the window of my studio is open, they will literally fly in and they will, you know, trip on my um, on my desk um, making these noises like, hurry up now, we're hungry. <laughs> Haven't you noticed? And when they are in bad luck, um, one of the cats will be here in my studio too, or the dog, and then it's always panic in the house because... I don't want them to kill the birds so uh, oh I've saved so many birds but most birds that came in and that were caught by one of our animals left the house without a tail they always grab the tail first and it's oh. so anyway but I know these birds and these birds know me when I walk in the garden they don't leave because they know me they know I feed them so then when the peregrine falcon um, there is a, a, a nest close by in a, um, what's it called, in a broadcast tower um, that's really close by here as well. And they put a, a falcon's nest in there for the peregrine falcon because the peregrine falcon is actually a falcon that, that likes living in, in a city, that likes to live in towers. And, um, you know, and we have a lot of gulls here at the edge of town. And there were many people who didn't want to have the gulls in their gardens and on their roof. So if you have a peregrine falcon that will hunt them, that's, you know, a natural way of driving these birds away, which especially now is incredibly important because there is um, this type of um, gull, a, a smaller gull, that uh, now is infested with bird flu and is spreading it through the country just before the winter birds um, are coming back here. Um, so, you know, I've already seen the first two species that came back north from Africa. So uh, I think having the peregrine falcon around now is very good, but still, um, our garden is not very big, but it's big enough for the peregrine falcon to hunt here, which they will do since we feed the birds all year through. Because, you know, with the biodiversity nearly completely gone here, um, there are so many birds that have become dependent on, um, on us feeding, on people feeding. So we feed. Um, we spend quite a bit of money every year on bird seeds. Um, we plant local plants that have that we know that birds eat that we know will have insects in and on them that birds eat we we try to we try to do our best to help get the balance a little bit back in order which is really great and it's also nice because we get to see a lot of birds we actually have had quite a few rare birds in our garden as well um, that some people have told me I'm jealous you've seen them because I've never seen them before and I never know that because I don't know that much but what I do is I tr when I see there is a bird in the garden that looks different than any I've seen I'll try to photograph it it's never a pretty picture because I don't have I'm not a photographer so you know but I can always um, people can all, oh I'm gonna show you oh god it's just right there on the corner of the shed oh god i don't know if you can see it can you see it behind the flower can you see it? there it is do you see it now you might just experience one of the dove bombings that i get to deal with on a daily basis because <laughs> it's actually what it's doing now is it's showing me hey i'm hungry i'm here i'm here i'm here look the way he, look at the way he's looking there are gulls flying over its head too so it's careful now but it's looking at me at the same time 
um, trying to make clear to me that it is really, really hungry. So if you see me start a loud boom, <laughs> that's what it is. Nothing to worry about. But I, um, I've experienced some challenges with um, doing my paintings when these birds feel they need to make something clear to me every now and then because I, I always startle and I'm always scared they hurt themselves. I will always go outside to look so they conditioned me right. <laughs> Wild birds have conditioned me to take care of them. <laughs> oh. Two. Let me see. Oh, it's it's right behind. There was one on the on top of that little birdhouse, and there is another one now behind the leaf. It's popping its head over that, and um, it's quite funny. It's a. Uh, it's quite funny. But having the peregrine falcon in our garden, I think, is something good. It's it's impressive, and I I deeply admire the bird. Um, but I also feel a little bit sad because the doves that come here are always the same and I know them and they know me. So I know that when he's been, when the falcon has been successful, he has killed one of my darlings, literally. And last, you know, two weeks ago, there was um, a big hunt going on in our garden. And um, because there were so many doves here, it was very cold, it was snow. Uh, so yeah, all the birds were eating here because I I put I I feed them every day and I make sure that they have water even when it's freezing. So the peregrine falcon knows he knows where to go, and um, so he was here, but he didn't catch at least not when I could see it. But um, then um, last Thursday. Um, I saw something from the corner of my eye and it was so fast, it was fast as lightning, which is, which can only be the peregrine falcon. And, um, the only thing that was left when I looked again was a, a thick layer of, um, of small white and gray feathers on top of that little bird feeding house that's on the side of my shed that I just showed you. So then, you know, he took one of my darlings and indeed um, we were one dove down. So, yeah, it's kind of, um, I'm letting things happen. Um, I also have two cats and some, there was people who don't really know how we operate were, um, you know, um, I don't know, angry or like, how can you feed the birds when you have two cats? But the thing is that um, every year we have nests of birds in a garden and every now and then there is this really silly pair of, of birds that will make a lot of noise, um, twittering all the time, saying, here we are, here we are, here we are. Well, those birds will not be that lucky with our tomcat because he will go, he will, he will um, find that nest of birds and if he doesn't find it the cat from across the street will come over here and find the nest but we've had so many successful um, couples of birds producing lots and lots of babies and in recent years we've had um, oh god what are they called again house no what's it called again a really beautiful the gold goldfinch I think I think it's called goldfinch with a red head and a golden ochre body with black edge with black on the wings and, and a very bright yellow edge and they are really really beautiful really lovely um, and we have had them reproduce in our garden for years as well as house tits um, uh, wrens, um, robins, um, so, and if we tot up the totals, we know, you know, that we have helped reproduce more birds than that the cats caught. Um, and also the cat now, these days, he's old, <laughs> and we have um, a feeling he is um, suffering from some kind of Alzheimer's for cats. Um, so he's not effective anymore and the um, the puss that we have, the she-cat, uh, she is not successful at all. She catches a lot but all she, she specialises in, in mice, which is a good thing. 
Um, and our tomcat, the only thing he catches these days are brown rats. So do we have a lot of rats? Um, unfortunately, yes. Um, our garden is a square space and in that edge of the garden behind the shed um, is the bend of um, a ditch. And the ditch um, goes past what used to be an orchard and that is now a field where they grow uh, corn. Um, but the problem is that um, when the orchard came down, the rats that lived in the side of the ditch in the orchard decided to move into the um, into this, um, uh, what do you say, into our neighborhood. So they came to live with the people. We've never had that problem. Um, some, when the orchard was still there, sometimes in the winter when we were feeding the birds, you would suddenly see a mummy rat sitting there collecting food. And if you threw out your rotten apple, if you threw out your apples that were a little, you know, the due date, what you would sometimes see in the snow was a hopping apple. And if you look closely, it was a rat underneath. But they would always leave the garden and they would go back into the side of the ditch they lived in. But now, all of a sudden, um, I think last summer, we, we, we entered the shed after a couple of weeks that we hadn't been in there. It was like, oh God, the smell, what's that? And we, felt, we found some um, rat poopies. So um, yeah, we know they, are, they have moved in here looking for food because in the orchard, there would always be enough food for them, you know? Apples would drop um, when, when, when during the time of apple picking, um, all the apples with really bad spots in them would be dropped onto the floor and they would all be, always be taken away by the rats and they would collect huge um, reserves of food for the winter. Those reserves are gone. So now there is corn, but corn is not interested, interesting, especially because the type of corn they grow here is for um, cattle food only. It's not uh, a type of corn that you can eat. It's very hard. It needs to be processed before it can be eaten. And also there is a lot, a lot of toxins that are sprayed on that corn. So I think these rats know better and feel that it's worth the risk um, of living, you know, uh, among cats. And fortunately, well, it's it's double, you know, I, 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 I used to have tame rats. I love them. They are intelligent and social. They are um, very, very kind when they know you. They, they, they are even caring in a way when they know you. They're very, very, very great animals. Um, and yet, on the other hand, um, I don't, we, we, you know, we can't have wild rats living with us because you know if there is one nest there will be a great many more you know because they can have many many nests a year so it's impossible to um you know to keep the rats here so we have decided to let our tomcat just do his you know carry out his hobby and hunt the rats which he does successfully we had a neighbor complaining about the tomcat once he was like, oh, he's pooping in a garden, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, and, and my husband was standing there, and all of a sudden, the cat dove onto something and grabbed a big brown rat right from the garden of the neighbor. And then my husband says, yes, maybe he does do a few poopies, but he also takes care of the rats for you. We've never had any more complaints, but yeah. That's how it works when you live very close to a ditch. <laughs> it's, um, it, it, it's nice, but it can have its challenges, and this is one of them. But the peregrine falcon doesn't go for rats, so that's what the cats do, or our tomcat. And our puss, um, she's a street kitten. Um, she, she's a specialist in mice, which is really great because, um, you know, I, I, I don't kill animals i don't do poisons i don't i don't i try to make life as unattractive for them here in the garden as i can as i know how to but i do not do poison i don't believe in poison i don't i don't believe in violent killing of animals in the first place in the second place i think i know that if i poison one 
one um, shackle in the ch in the chain of life, I will poison much more because the a poisoned rat or mouse will die, and it will be eaten by other bugs and and animals, and they too will be poisoned. Um, I don't want that to happen. Um, you know, um, contrary to most people. I don't feel like they are invading my space. Um, we humans have invaded their space. And what I am trying to do, if, as long as I can, I know that the, there could be a time when it's just not possible, when you have an explosion of, of rats and mice, you have to undertake some very unsympathetic action. But up until that time, I'm going to try and keep it sympathetic enough. And Maybe I've been a little bit too sympathetic about that when there was a family of mice came to live right next to our back door. They never ever came into the house. Let me be clear about that. I don't think mice are dirty either, by the way, or rats. I don't think they're dirty. Um, they're just super cute. <laughs> but they live right by the back door and I was starting to get concerned. Um, because I knew that if a mouse sets foot in the house, it's going to get killed. And, well, it should probably happen. It's nature. I don't want to see it. Um, and I also don't want, you know, a half-dead suffering mouse. Um, you know, it's... Mm. So, um, one day I was talking about this to my husband. I said, how can we solve this? And the thing was... We were not the only ones who had noticed, and within four days, um, the greater part of the mouse family um, was dead and buried by our cat, by the the, the street kitten. And um, so, yeah, it's you know that's always with nature. Nature is beautiful and lovely, but it's also ferocious. And um, yeah, as as human beings, we sort of stepped out of that system. We have other people kill animals for us to to eat them so it sort of seems like that's a very wild and gruesome thing to do because we don't do it anymore um but yeah other than that so long talk and all stemming from this tree that i'm drawing and this tree by the way when you see the hollow space you know who did that you know who started this the woodpecker, a black and white woodpecker with um, a red head. And there is a smaller version and a bigger version. It was the bigger version and I don't know what it's called in English. But that's the one who started this hole. And when this, when there was a little hole, it became bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And now it's this big. So I said it's an old tree and I think I'm afraid it's going to die. I think that if we have another extremely hot summer like last year, it might die, but I've also been eyeballing the tree all day today with the storm because it was a southwest, a west southwest storm. So the tree was getting a full blow, um, but it turns out the tree is still there. So it's tougher than I thought, but I'm expecting, I sort of, I'm half expecting it to go down any moment. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm drawing this as um, a really good exercise in textures and in, in, in depth. How do you create depth? This is a rather abstract painting. When I pull away this um, the tape, it will be quite an abstract painting. Um, and still you'll be able to see what it is, which is what I want. I want it to be recognisable. But it's, um, it's a really tough exercise. So, yeah. You want to see the box I'm painting with? Some people really like that. I got the question a little while ago. Can you show us your paint box? This is Caroline's paint box. Was sent to me years and years and years ago by Caroline, who turned out to be my sister from another mother. We met. She came from the United States to the Netherlands. And she gave me um, all samples of these... Um, a granulating Daniel Smith paints and I've been using them ever since I've added a few others I added um, black tourmaline genuine and I added um, a couple um, Horidam ultra granulating the um, volcano yellow 
Volcano Red and Shire Blue um, because of the uniqueness of the yellow and the red pigment and because I really really loved um, the Shire Blue um, as, a, um, as one of the colors in my work. So that's what I use and this by the way is the it broke the lid broke off the the palette unfortunately it was my dog's doing um when he was young one day he jumped onto this work table and kicked off this um this paint box <laughs> he's only a reason schnauzer a giant schnauzer a really really big one you know a really big dog we call him a bulldozer which he is and you know he will jump on this table and um I have no doubt that when I do more videos um, this year, that in a few weeks time, when it's warm enough for me to open the doors and the windows, right outside my studio window is a beautiful garden table, a big one. And it is, it happens to be the favorite place of our giant schnauzer to lie down on because he hates sunshine and that table is always in the shade even in summer so if i if i can't find him that's the first place i need to go and what will happen since it's a high table it is just a little bit lower than my own work table is can you guess yes he will step into my studio onto my work table and then jump off here right next to me um it is hilarious and i can't ever get myself to be angry when he does that um so i'm not exactly teaching him not to although i should because he really did walk on a painting once fortunately his feet were dry so there was no big damage done the only thing you could see was a little imprint of one of the nails of his feet um but yeah it's something i i should definitely not promote <laughs> right so i i i have done a long studio chat on the fly i hope you've enjoyed it um it's been a little bit fuzzy in the beginning you know me thinking if people were coming home and then I showed you a bit of my garden because I saw the falcons hunting and I thought maybe they were gonna dive back into the in, into the garden because there were a lot of birds at the time during our talk there have been magpies jackdaws doves um, they saw the red breast um, magpies did I already mention magpies um, doves and pigeons there were pigeons in the garden as well robins and um what are the other ones called marulas what are they called again blackbirds blackbirds i think are they called blackbirds i think they're called blackbirds they were in here too so yeah it was nice it was nice they were alone <laughs> well if you like my um video please give me a thumbs up if you've got any questions um if you're asking me if i'll do a review or a demo um of the um Karen Dush aquarelle um i am thinking of doing it it's just that i'm not going to be making any promises about when um the thing is I've been having great trouble in organizing things like I said in the beginning of the video to make these vid to make these videos um, to make the time to be alone and to be able to do the thing I want to need to do then so um, and it takes quite a bit of time and I can only do that during the day be when I have daylight because um, you know it's important I think to have as natural and as good a lighting as I can get so I don't like doing that in the evening hours so I need to be doing that during the day I have no idea when I'll be ready what I um, will do is I'll be pay I'll be using them more and more to you know I will I, I do want to find an application for them because these were very very expensive I don't even want to mention I don't even know by heart how much they were but they were they were very very expensive um, but I will I will tell you more about them as I work with them and about the things that I'm doing So I hope you enjoyed the video and if you did please give me your thumbs up We really need them more than ever now things have changed in the YouTube algorithm land Which means we're getting way fewer views 
and um, we really need the interaction for the algorithms so that people will be able to find us um, yeah it's kind of sad it used to be such a good place here things are changing really really fast unfortunately but you know what I'll be here and um, you know I was never in it for the big bucks and the affiliations that's um, so yeah right so um, oh if you I'm also working on another project I want to tell you all about that in a bit but it's not quite ready yet and I'll tell you all about that if you want to keep informed you can also subscribe to my Monday mail my newsletter um, I only send out the newsletter when there is news there is no there is no steady frequency in that there are geese flying over now by the way I love geese but there is no steady frequency I'm not filling up your mailbox just because I want to do that every week and you know I don't so if you want to I only send that news when there actually is something interesting to share <laughs> right thank you very much for watching if you have any questions or remarks you can leave them below this video and um, looking forward to see you again in the next video bye